Good morning. Grace and peace to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Glad you're in this place of worship today. If you're sitting near the center, you'll find a red attendance pad. If you would find that red pad and pass it down. Uh, and uh, by putting your name on that, it helps us really be able to keep track of you. And we're glad that you do that. Thank you. Well, we're not sure how the temperature is here this morning, but when we came in, we, we didn't have the heat up the right way here. We got the heat up now, so hopefully you'll be warming up as we go here. Uh, but we're glad you're able to be with us today. Now, just a couple things we want to be looking at announcement-wise. Uh, Trick-or-treat or trunk-or-treat is going to take place on Halloween night. Uh, that's when the trick-or-treating is going on all over town here. So that'll be on that Thursday night, October the 31st. And a lot of you have signed up for that. It's really great. We never have too many cars, though, signed up to pass out candy. We want it to be a, an event whenever the people come into our parking lot. So if you would like to be part of that, we would love to have you. Just know you could do it. One of the things that we are discovering right at the moment is that, uh, th that we uh, served, last year we served about 500 cups of hot chocolate. And we're going to be doing the same thing again. And instead of everyone just bringing different kinds of hot chocolate light, if, if you wanted to help out with that, uh, just a, a small gift or whatever, uh, and wanted to help out with that, all you need to do is take, a, take a, uh, your gift and put it in an envelope that's in your pew and mark it hot chocolate. That's a good clue. We'll know what it's for, okay? And then we'll be able to have the hot chocolate ready to go. Um, the other thing that's in your pew, you'll find a red pad or a red envelope as well for Operation Christmas Child. And um, that's going to be, we're going to have a packing party on November the 7th. And of course, the cost of, of being able to send a box now, I believe, is about $9. And if you'd like to put uh, uh, cash in the envelope, that would go towards sending the, the boxes out. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like you to see this short video. We're going to take a look at it for Operation Christmas Child, and we get to get the flavor of what we're doing. And the fun is watching the children. This could be the first present that they've ever received. These children just received the shoe boxes. You can see how excited they are. <laughs> Operation Christmas Child Gifts really touches children's heart. This shoe box is a demonstration of the love of God. During distribution, we tell children that there is a God who created us and who loved us. of life and all ages love packing Operation Christmas Child shoebox gifts. What an amazing moment and opportunity to show people, to really show people the love of God. Samaritan's Purse would not be able to do Operation Christmas Child without this army of volunteers. They're like angels. It's just a special opportunity to reach people with the love of Christ. By the way, I'm so grateful for these boxes and what they represent. Lives are being changed and souls are being saved and the Lord is receiving the glory. So to God, I'm, I'm about to cry, please. Once you pack the shoebox, from there they'll be sent all around the world. And that is only the beginning. After children receive gifts, we welcome them to the Greatest Journey 12 Lesson Discipleship Program. The program introduces them to Jesus Christ and teaches them stories from the Bible. It sets a good Christian foundation for them and sends them on a brand new journey of life. Isn't it incredible to see the impact these simple gifts are making in the lives of children all over the world? of boys and girls are hearing and responding in faith and then taking the gospel truly to the ends of the earth. A lot of these children, their life is absolutely transformed. Jesus said, let them come to me. And we're in the middle of bringing the children to Jesus. What amazes me the most is the miracles in each box. Thank 
you for your prayers. Thank you for your continued support. Many children around the world still need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We always need more shoeboxes. So keep packing. Thank you. And God bless. So for that reason, the red uh, envelopes are in the pews, and, and you can use that to help finance that. Plus, if you would set aside November the 7th for the packing party, which will be packing about uh, uh, 200 boxes, and that gets done best with a lot of hands. I know that when I work really fast, there's just a few that I get done, and so we really need as many people as possible to enjoy that. It was a fun night last year, and I think it will be again. Now, as we, uh, as we get ready to, to begin the, the worship service today, um, I want you to just uh, take a look around at, at some of those that are here and some of those that aren't here and, uh, and just say, say hello to them. So will you take this moment and greet one another in Christ's name? <laughs> Sister, good to see you. Hi, Myrna. How are you? That's a pretty sweater. How do you keep that clean? I don't wear it very often. <laughs> uh, that makes sense.
I invite you to stand, if you're able, for the call to worship, printed in your bulletin and shown on the screen. How beautiful is the word of the Lord. Through the Lord's precepts, we gain understanding. The Lord is our God. We are God's people. Living word, great teacher, lead us and guide us. Amen. We remain standing as, as we sing together. Number 400, come thou fount of every blessing. Come the fount of every blessing through my heart to sing thy grace. <laughs> Would you? <laughs> See, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song sung by flame. Tongues of
the ushers will wait upon you for your offerings and tithes. Let us worship together. Lord, we are grateful to you for everything that you have done for us. The cattle on a thousand hill belong to you. You are the giver of every good gift. From the abundance with which you care for us, we bring back to you and lay a portion at your feet. Asking, Lord, that you use these gifts for your kingdom here, around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite the children to come forward at this time. Watch, watch that court. for me. Well, I have some honey bears here. Honey bears have honey in them here. 
we, uh, we found out that this was a little cold this morning and it was tough to, the bear didn't want to give it up very well. M Madison, would you come down here and hold that? And I need you to hold that with both hands because if this flips upside down, uh, I would be in trouble with the people who try to keep this place clean, okay? <laughs> so you got a hold of it? You got a good grip on that? The question is, do I? Okay, here we go. I think a table would have been nice here. Look at that. We're just going to let that pile up there, I think. Nothing. How many of you adults back there would love to have a taste of this honey right now? You know, in the Bible, when it talks about a land flowing with milk and honey, it was all about animals and, and milk. And then anything that was called honey was that which was sweet. Yes, honey, as we know, coming from bees, but also honey that, that would be from dates or grapes, anything that would be dried out and become sugary in some shape or form, that was a honey. So here, I think we've been able to do pretty well. Madison, you've done this very well. Thank you very much. Experience tells me that uh, we'll just keep that right there. Now, I can take that for you for the moment. One of the reasons that I, that I did this, and I've done this before you, in fact, Josiah remembers it, uh, but uh, it's been a, a little over three years since I did this. One of the things we get, when we read out of Psalm 119, 103, it talks about how good God's word is. The Bible, the things that he tells us, he says, it, it, and, and God's word is sweet, uh, and it's like the taste of honey. One of the things that the rabbis used to do whenever they had the kids that were your age, uh, when they'd get them together, and the rabbis were the teachers, and the rabbis were the ones who taught them how to read and to write. And the reason they learned how to read and write was so that they could read the word of God. And, uh, and so one of the things that they would do on the very first day, they would start to make their letters and write the letters of the alphabet. So some of the rabbis would take a, a clean slate, like a board of some kind, and, and pour honey all over that. And then, you know, how, how that, look how the, that starts to level out. And then they would make it so that they could write in it. So they'd take a stylus, and for lack of a better, better system here, I brought a pretzel. To, a stylus would be like a pencil, okay, uh, or a pen. I need you to hold that for me, I guess. Thank you very much, Madison. And if you drop that at all, I'm, I'm going to blame your dad. Just want you to know that, not you. Does that sound, does that, does that we all agree? All in favor of making Harry responsible for the honey, say aye. That's well, done, Harry. Okay, this is good. All right, thank you very much. So he would, he would take the stylus, and he'd have them write. I'm going to make an X. Because in, in Greek, they, they wouldn't have been writing in Greek right away, but in Greek, X is the first letter for Christ. Uh, it's come from Christos, which is like a X in English, but an X is, is uh, really how you make that heart sound for Christ. And so if I put an X in there, and then that reminds me of, of Jesus. And then he'd tell the students, now having written God's word or the name of Jesus, he says, now taste it. The word of God is sweet like honey. Tastes like honey. Sweet. Good to remember and good to experience. Would any of you like to try this? Would you? Do you want to use my pretzel? No. no, I didn't think so. Good decision. Master, would you like to try it? You've already done a lot. Good. So, Madeline, so it's a good thing. It's a good thing we got you here. Okay. Uh, you don't like honey, right? I got you. Then you're going to get to double dip. We never double dip, but you're going to get to double dip here. All right, make it X, which is like thinking of Christ. And that's a good way to remember it. Now, I want you to taste that and tell me what that tastes like. Sweet. Is it sweet? God's word is like that. Would you like to dip again and try that again? All right. Yeah. All right, now let's see if you can make a J in there. Can you make a J in there for Jesus? And now the rabbi would say, Mad beautiful J. I want you to taste this and see how the word of God is very sweet to the taste. Pretty good, huh? All right. Um, any chance you want to take this back with you when you go back today? <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I bet you do. 
I think so no one else wants it. I think I'm going to let you do that. And, uh, and, then, and then it'll be up to Skip to clean up if anything goes wrong here. <laughs> That's good. So uh, you can sit down now, Madeline. So that, that is uh, the way they would teach. They take something that tastes really good. Um, I could have used maple syrup. I could have used uh, candy. That, that whatever. I could have used icing. The idea, yeah, you know, we like icing here. Okay, I have to remember that icing for. But but whatever we use on that uh, is a way that what we, they would try to teach young people that the word of God is so special that it's sweet like honey or sweet like icing or sweet like maple syrup. Got that? All right, that's how I want you to feel about learning God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, I give you thanks. I give you thanks for my for my friends, and uh, uh, they. They understand these principles so amazingly well. And it's my prayer that, that you will help them to understand how sweet your word is, how the things that you teach us um, taste good. Maybe it's not that they taste like honey, but the way we like honey is the way we will like your word. So help my young friends to grow up in wisdom and stature of favor with both God and man. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, would you be willing to help us with, uh, with the penny collection today? Penny collection is still going towards Wesley Woods. Over here on this side is where they are. Thank you. If you're willing to turn in your hymnal to number 622, just remain seated while we sing.
before we go to the Lord in prayer, I just wanted to say to all of you here how grateful I am to this church. You were not only a financial support for the Titusville Ladies Conference, but your prayers and, and just your support meant so much to 150 women who came from all over this weekend just to be transformed by the Lord. And that is a very special thing to be able to say that. And I was so over the weekend I was reminded that Jerry and I have been here about seven years now. And I remember the first day we walked into the church and you all were so welcoming. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that. When we have strangers here or someone who's visiting, let them know that you welcome them to the doors and hope and pray that they're going to continue to be in a church on a Sunday morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, we adore you, we love you, and we give you the praise. Every day of our lives, you pour down blessings upon us. Some we recognize and some we don't. But Lord, you give us so much. And we know there are days when we stumble, days when we might not be doing what we should be doing. But you are such a forgiving God. You love us so much that it doesn't matter what we do. You just try to encourage us to be stronger in the Lord and stronger in our hearts. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. Many, many people have seen answers to prayer. But Lord, we know for others, they're still going through difficult times. And not one of us sitting here in this sanctuary this morning is not dealing with something. We have days of joy and we have days of sorrow. But we continue to lift up Pastor Lee and Margie and ask that you be with them. Be with Pastor Lee as he goes through this chemo. And Lord, we think about the Frankies. And we know it's so hard on Bert. Some days we get good news and some days we get bad news. But they continue to be here and to be in the sanctuary. And we keep drawing closer to you in fellowship. May we continue to pray for all those in need, whatever that need might be. And Lord, this morning we just thank you that we have a church where we can worship, where we can pray, where we can lift up our concerns to you, knowing that you already knew them before we even prayed them. But you're always there to answer us one way or the other. Lord, help us to trust. Help us to place our total trust in you, to give up control, and to let you be in charge. And we thank you that we can come together this morning, praying your prayer together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a reminder to all of you that there are a number of classes and Bible studies you can participate in during the course of this week, uh, and uh, just keep reading through your bulletin. Uh, please know that the Finance Committee is not meeting this week. I want to make sure that I clarify that. Uh, secondly, I know that the Bible study that usually meets out of Romans starts tonight, meeting right here in Murray Parlor. Um, it, uh, the Bible study starts right at 6 o'clock. It ends at 7 but if you'd like uh, to maybe share a little bit of food and such, uh, come before that. Come earlier in that. Anyway, time after 5.30, there'll be sharing a fellowship there. And then the Bible study starts at 6. Just know that you're all welcome. The scripture today is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning in verse 27. The days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will plant the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the offspring of men and of animals, just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down and to overthrow, destroy and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I sometimes have to divide up the congregation to those who were alive in 1960 and those who were not. And let me just see that. If you were around in 1960 and can remember it, by the way, and, of the, and those of you who were not alive in 1960, let me see your hand. All right, we outnumber you. You young whippersnappers, we're glad you're here. Uh, and I'm probably guilty sometimes of talking about old days way too much. But that's who I am, so just deal with it, okay? Uh, Austin is good for you to get to here. Let me tell you, Austin, what Christmas present we got in 1960. We got an Etch-A-Sketch. 1960. You probably didn't even know there was a 1960, to tell you the truth. But I'm here to tell you that, that uh, that's one of those, that, and I've got a picture of it here for you, if you just take a look at that up there. Uh, remember they had those red frames and white uh, knobs? And, uh, and it really took the nation by storm. A company called Ohio Art Company put this out. I think I was in second grade, somewhere in there. And uh, I, all I know is it isn't that every one of the kids got an Etch-A-Sketch either, right? Four kids in a family, one Etch-A-Sketch. I'm the third child. That means I was well down the pecking order of who got to play with that. But it was a really cool thing. And, uh, and all during that Christmas vacation that year, with one of those older ones were to put that, put that thing down, we would grab it and try to hide somewhere. And, and whatever they had written on that, we'd turn it upside down and shake it to get rid of their images and start fresh. All new was something that I could write myself. Etch a sketch. Really, really a big deal. Uh, and I only say that, but I think uh, ways of writing over the history has been amazing. We already talked about putting honey on a slate board and, and kids being able to write uh, some letters sometimes in something sweet like that. Uh, I have a picture here of a clay tablet. You know, sometimes we think of ancient writings and clay tablets as some big stone that they were on, but actually they were more the size of a credit card. I don't mean thickness, but, but uh, circumference like that, of a credit card or maybe a cell phone. Uh, and that, with that in that hand gives you an idea of what they looked like on that. The clay was wet, and they would take a stylus, and they'd be able to print things out like that. Um, Clark Hall still knows how to write like that, I think. I think Clark goes back to those years like that. And, and you just take the wet things, and you make the impression upon that. Uh, and uh, it's really very effective. Now, and it was really good for making out grocery lists or purchase orders or whatever. But if you wanted it to, like a document, to keep for a long, long time, you would put it in a kiln and fire it, and, uh, and so then that heat would, uh, would, would form that and it'd be well. One of the reasons we also know that is that sometimes these things were caught in a fire, and it would do the same thing. It would preserve it. But for the most part, all you need to do with these clay tablets was to wet them down again, and you could begin to smooth it over and begin to write on them all over again. So it was pretty cool. Along then comes a slate and chalk. 
uh, which was a very helpful slate would clean up and uh, chalk could be erased and then you could write again uh, until about the 1800s, the very first stand up blacktop or blacktop, yeah, blackboard was put in a classroom in Edinburgh. Uh, by a geography teacher, put this, uh, uh, put a, a a blackboard on the, you know, on the wall, and the students began to began to do it. Think of the tension that came with this blackboard. Now your math problems need to be written in such a way that the whole class can see. And it comes time to conjugate verbs, and then you got to put it for everyone to see, or to uh, diagram a sentence. Someone could please explain to me what a predicate is to this day, right? And, and so we'd be putting all that up on the board, totally humiliated sometimes, and you could hear your friends sometimes snickering, or they'd whisper, say, that's the wrong spelling, you know? I can remember all those days all too well. I've got some deep scars, I, I want you to know that. All because of that blacktop, blacktop, no, blackboard, <laughs> where I had to, had to write and, 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 and perform in front of everybody, it seems like, and they could see the mistakes that I would be making. Um, you, uh, if you are of a certain age as well, you can remember how, how the, the dry erasers would be there in order, to, in order to wipe the chalk away and then how dusty those would get. And then if the teacher wasn't looking, it was fun to get those things and just start banging them together. Remember? And a cloud of chalk dust would go all over the place. Do you remember that? Or is this just, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. And if you were really in trouble with the teacher, the teacher would make you write on the board 25 times, I will not talk in class. I will not talk in class. Remember, remember doing that? It was just, just brutal. This was an instrument of meanness, I believe, focused on, you know, put on us by the educational system that we've all gone through. Um, but the cool thing about it is that you could take a wet rag and you could clean that blackboard up in such a way in which there was no chalk dust anymore whatsoever. Well, later on, <clears throat> we moved to what's called uh, some green boards. <coughs> and those were made out of steel and porcelain, I'm told. And they didn't show the chalk dust quite as much, so they were considered a much more modern type of way to do it. And, uh, and some felt like it was easier on your eyes. Uh, I don't know that I agree with that, but, but anyhow, that's what that was put for. And that led to dry eraser boards. Then you started having trouble with people using a permanent marker on a dry eraser board. And then, then they had to sell products in order to get that off. And, and, uh, and on it goes so much. So I happen to believe that the Etch-A-Sketch was the finest of all kinds of things. And for those of you in the 60s, you'll recognize uh, Leonard Nimoy and all, all you uh, trekkers out there uh, would recognize that. That's a, that's a hard picture to be able to write on an Etch-A-Sketch, isn't it? Because you could, you could draw straight lines really well. And, and by the way, the way those work, it seemed like magic to me as a kid, but the way that, that works is, is that there were these uh, polystyrene beads in there along with uh, aluminum dust uh, that, that, that was set up so that it wouldn't clump up. The beads kept it from clumping up. And that would cover the inside of that screen so that when you moved the stylus around, it would wipe that dust off and you'd have a black line there. To me, it was as magic as possibly be. But what I really liked was when my brother and sisters were drawing things on that and I wanted my own picture, I could shake it <laughs> and get rid of their image and put my own on that. Uh, circles and curves were were really unforgiving, but I could start over again and again. Well, that's different from what the Israelites felt in Jeremiah's day. For them, the law of God was written on stone. The law of Moses was written on stone. Everyone knows that Moses looked like Charlton Heston, so I always keep that image in front of you. But it's just written in stone, and, and there's no, it, it's so hard and fast and unending. Um, ten Commandments were put on there. It could have been written in clay tablets, but those could be smoothed over. Um, in fact, from Rome and, and, and during the Roman Empire, we get the phrase called, I think, tabula rasa or rasa or whatever that is, but clean slate. Uh, my Latin is, is, is hurting here big time. But we get the idea of a clean slate, where wipe it clean, but not the Ten Commandments. They were etched in stone. The Israelites carried it with them everywhere they went. 
And what do we know about the Ten Commandments and, and the Old Testament law? It was there to show us how we don't measure up to God uh, and that he's a holy God. And, and all we did many times, we've seen how many times we, we fall short of the glory of God. And so the Israelites had this elaborate uh, system of sacrifice and forgiveness that they would have to perform in order to, to seek the forgiveness of God. And once a year, the, once a year there would be this uh, uh, national type of a thing where the, where the sins were placed on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the goat and driven into the wilderness. Be- uh, beautiful symbol of forgiveness, but it was, un- it was unending. You, you, you just had to hope again and again that you would allow for forgiveness to take place eventually. And that's what the written in stone does. And then what happened? The Babylonian captivity takes place. You know, around 580, 87 BC, somewhere in there. Who's counting, right? Somewhere in that time was when the captivity takes place. And, uh, and I already shared with you last week that there was a, about a year and a half siege at Jerusalem. So they were starving and it was absolute disaster. And Israel understood that this was God's judgment on them. Um, through the New Testament, we see all this a little bit different, but, but the prophets were very clear as to what they believed was going on at that time. And, that, and in fact, Jeremiah even writes that God had presided over the destruction of Jerusalem and the Israelites. Really sounds harsh, but it's real. Not only did that destruction take place, these stone tablets... We're lost. We don't know if they were, we don't know if they were broken. We don't know if they were stolen. We don't know if maybe they're put in a big warehouse in New Jersey, like what the movie suggests, right? Uh, we just don't know what happened to us. But here's what it meant to, to the Jews. That their hopes of knowing the word of God was devastated. How could they know God if they did not have a record of his word. Devastating time, as I'd always said. Jeremiah begins to talk about, they understood that they had broken the covenant of God and that they were being punished as that part of it. And so it was a devastating time for them. Then we find out that Jeremiah says, but a day is coming, and he begins to talk about a new covenant. The day is coming when God's laws would be no longer be written in stone. Wow. No longer written in stone. A new covenant. Almost like it was going to be written in such a way that was erasable, like an Etch-a-Sketch would be. Um, And uh, the scripture says that I will put my law within them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Something different was happening from the old covenant to this new covenant that was getting ready to take place. I see that almost with this, um, with this concept of, of the Etch-a-Sketch type of thing. Uh, it was going to be possible to be forgiven without the animal sacrifice, without the ritual that always had been involved with forgiveness in the house of Israel. Jeremiah talked about a new time in which God would be writing upon their hearts upon their minds, a surface that was flexible, a surface in which he could reveal himself. I go back to the green board that I had put before you, keep that in front of you, and I know that this day and age, that has all been replaced by, by before, white uh, dry eraser board, and now more of, a, uh, more of these smart tablets or smart boards. Uh, and uh, I had fun. There probably were four or five current uh, teachers in the early service. So as you know, I, all you who've been educators, I, I love to talk to you because I'm so bitter about my school experience growing up that I like to tease you all the time. And uh, so I, I asked them how many of them got to use, how many of them get to use these, these, uh, uh, these smart boards that, that are up there right now. And they, they all raised their hand and I was able to get an honest answer out of one who's not in the school district, by the way, so it's a safe answer. Uh, in fact, she's in a school district down around Pittsburgh and, and it's a it's, a, it's an excellent school district. I said, so when, do you have a smart board in your class? She said, yes. And I said, do they, do they teach you how to use it? She said, we don't get training for anything. And so, 
So here's what we're doing. We're putting some of this great technology in the classes. And, uh, and, and so, you know, of course, Justin Klein sitting back there and, and uh, you know, along, you know, along with, with uh, his wife. And, and I suggested that, Justin, do you know how to use it? He goes, he has a new one put in there. And he, he says, we're supposed to do that. He says, you, you want to teach the way you've always learned how to teach, but you have to learn these new methods all the time to be able to do it. But the advantage of these smart board course is that you can, uh, you can put a video in there. You can put animation in there. You can uh, write it out like you would write things out on a chalkboard. And then you can draw on it along with the things that are already happening. They really are amazingly technical pieces. But at the same time, none of it seems to, none of it seems to wipe out traditional teaching and, and how, how the, the, you know, the, our educators, uh, the gifted educators, can do it no matter what tool they have. Can I just say that? All of you gifted educators, and you're in this place, you're able to do it because of the passion you have to be able to teach and to train. In God's passion for you and me, he has designed that his presence, his law, his word, is written on what I'm going to call a heart board in my mind, in the seat of my emotions. God has gone from something that we told about, showed through the stone tablets, to the fact that his presence now abides within you and me. Now, Jeremiah doesn't talk about Jesus in this passage. He doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit, but he does talk about a new covenant, a day that is coming in which, uh, in which God will write his law on the inside of our heart. How many of you have a conscience to this day? How many of you know what it's like to fall short of the glory of God or to treat someone in a way in which you, don't, you know you should not? And, and feel that, that prick of that conscience somehow that, that, you are, that, that you've stepped aside. That means that the law of God, his presence, is written inside you now. It isn't just something that we need to fret about. So when Paul is writing in the book of Romans, and he talks about natural revelation, that, that people, uh, even people who have not heard the name of Jesus, simply know that God exists because of what they see. I think it's a reminder that God has written in their hearts and minds. He tells the people of, of Israel in Jeremiah's day that I'm going to plant people and plant animals again, once again. He's going to make it productive, going to make this land wealthy again. But the thing that he was going to do differently, he wasn't writing any more stone tablets. He was going to write his laws on their heart. In the fullness of time, Jesus came into the world in the form of a baby. He lived, and we were able to see how God is living in our midst. You know, the history of God's presence is done like this. I'll just do a quick overview, but, but uh, you've heard this before, but let's just do it again. Whenever the Israelites were first going out to worship God, they needed to go to the mountain, Sinai, in order to witness his presence, right? A little bit later on, when they were traveling in the wilderness, God came down and inhabited the tabernacle, and they celebrated the presence. And the way, uh, the way the tabernacle and the and the tribes were set up, they were set up kind of a north, south, east, west, with God at the very center in the tabernacle, a beautiful symbol of God being with them. Later on, they were able to build the, uh, the, the temple that David was planning for, and Solomon was there, and, and they celebrated the, the beauty of, of, of God being in the midst of the nation of Israel. And then Jesus comes into the world. We have language like, we are the temple of God. Jesus abides in us. He lives within us. Um, how many, of you, how many of you have learned way, all kinds of things, not from the, just a Sunday school teacher, not just from a, from a clergy person or from your parents, but by reading God's word yourself, that his presence now is, is really in us. And what did the Holy Spirit, what was the promise of the Spirit? Jesus said, necessary that I go, that the Spirit will be able to come and will teach you all things. The new covenant is based on the fact that now God has written these things in our hearts and in our mind. Let me read these last two verses, 33 and 34. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. This is Jeremiah. After, after that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. 
I will be their God and they will be my people. Some of my favorite words. I may pray that as much as anything. Lord, be our God. Let us be your people. 34, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. It's not just a matter of preaching and proclaiming like that. Know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. See, the Israelites were struggling. You know that Old Testament concept that the sins of the fathers will be visited upon the third and fourth generation and on it goes, a thousand generations. That concept we see all through the Old Testament. Jeremiah begins to talk about a little bit different thing there that leans towards the New Testament. Uh, and he was dealing with, uh, dealing with how many people blamed Israel's judgment on the, the fathers that went before them. And, uh, and the older ones were blaming it on the, the younger ones. Do we not do that today many times? We think that everything is going wrong uh, in the church or in our country is uh, those young whippersnappers. Those ones born after 1960. <laughs> um, and, and he says that uh, he begins to talk about how, how the sour grapes of the father, meaning, uh, meaning the, the bitterness towards other people, and, uh, and for the young ones, their teeth set on edge, the, the bitterness they have towards other people. And Jeremiah was trying to say the time is coming where each man, each woman will be accountable for his sin and her sin. You're probably sitting beside the person who has forgiven you more than anyone else, right? Or you wouldn't still be sitting with them. I just invite you to take a moment and think about what all God has forgiven you from. Would you do that? It's a good exercise. We don't do it often enough. I'm not wanting to bask in sin. I just want you to think about everything that you have been forgiven. You've invited Jesus into your heart, into your mind. He's taken your sin away. What has he forgiven you of? Hear Jeremiah saying, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. It's an etch -a sketch It's shaken up and down. That which marks that you have made that have broken the heart of God in Jesus Christ is taken away. Can I get an amen? amen. And that's available to you for all time. So when someone tries to heap guilt on you, and say, yes, I give your life to Jesus, but you also have to do this and this and this in order to be saved, they're wrong. Or if you're part of this church and we tell you the only way to be a faithful Christian is to be, uh, to be studying the, the word of God in just a certain way or to stand in a certain position when you worship or you fill in the blank. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, well, I will forgive, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, what a privilege to be a pastor amidst your people. Sometimes the chief of sinners, but I have been forgiven so much and I cherish it, Lord. These people that are your people that I love stand in need of a fresh visit from you. Shake up their sin right now, Lord, and erase it. Erase it. Fill them with your spirit. Continue to write your presence upon their heart. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. We're going to close in singing today, Alas, it did my Savior bleed. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5.
embrace that. Because of that forgiveness, happy all the day. Have a very good day in this new life with Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen.